So hi, thanks, thanks for your interest and, and time uh, joining this uh, webinar. Um, look, today on, I note that it's the, uh, the winter solstice, at least for me. So I'll, I'll, um, I'll keep in mind the shortness of the, of the day and I'll, I'll, I'll try and work through this uh, presentation uh, efficiently. So I, I'd like to start with um, uh, a simple analogy before we start getting into how to estimate uh, properties uh, of rock masses. And, that, and that's with the strength of a, a steel bar or a rock bolt. Um, we, we can measure its, its ultimate tensile strength fairly simply. Uh, we may need to interpret uh, its yield strength. And then there are other mechanisms which we're less certain of, but we have standards that give good guidance, normally as, as a factor of its ultimate uh, tensile strength. So it's, I went through this because it's important to understand that even with a manufactured product has got different strengths and different failure mechanisms. So it's got different uh, strengths for different failure mechanisms. And, and that same complexity happens in a rock mass, whether it be uh, a rock slope uh, slide, a fractured and folded uh, rock, an underground uh, collapse, or small scale uh, stress failures. We, we need to understand the, the mechanism and that's the first important question to address. How will the rock mass fail? Because how it fails will determine the strength that we need to consider. And you revert back to that steel bar analogy. Uh, we don't have uh, a universal strength theory we can just plug into our, um, our models uh, we need to understand the, the, the mechanism first and, and then choose the appropriate uh, strength. Um, and I, I declare that I too, like uh, many others, are using um, this figure from, uh, I think it was first published by Evan Hook and, and Ted Brown in, in 1980s, in their 1980s paper. It schematically uh, shows the, the, the problem scale. So I'd like to start with the easy end of, of that spectrum and with, with intact rock. So sometimes uh, we can obtain samples of intact rock that are suitable, they're the right shape, the right size, right dimensions for fitting into a test frame. And there are several uh, strength index tests that we can use, that we can test for. Uh, we can also measure de deformation uh, characteristics. But there's a natural variability uh, because na rock is, a, is a, a natural product and it's dependent on, on many components, which can manifest themselves, uh, manifest in, in uh, results from on different um, sizes. So this, this chart here uh, presents uh, the characteristics or the, the, the relationship between the UCS versus specimen size. And so it's well known that it decreases, UCS decreases as, as, as the sample gets larger. But there's also evidence that um, when we get really small samples, it, it, there's the inverse is true. Okay, so it tends to be about, a, uh, the inflection points about 40 to 50 millimeters in diameter. So uh, that variability that natural variability is, you know, as, as I alluded to earlier, is a product of the, um, the, the rock itself and the, and the material itself. So we're developing um, the, uh, the, the criteria that we use for intact rock strength. And so there's many criteria that have been developed. Um, there's a list there of, you know, some 15, 16 um, uh, criteria. And they're the ones that come up more often or not in, in publications. And the three that I've starred there, put in the blue star, they're the ones when I did the research, they tended to give the most uh, consistent um, uh, fits or they'll, they'll more consistently better fits to, to the intact um, uh, lab test data. Okay, but th that, that data is, is variable in all the tests. So UCS, uh, which... The UCS, which lie on, on the, the, the axis here, um, the, the indirect Brazilian indirect tensile uh, strength test uh, and the triaxials. There's, there's lots of variability in, 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 the, in the lab test results. 
and I'm going to use the uh, Triassic aged Hawkesbury sandstone as, as an example. So the, the Hawkesbury sandstone covers Sydney. It, it covers an area about 10,000 square kilometres. It's up to 200 metres thick. It's horizontally bedded, two vertical joint sets, and those joint sets are largely uh, widely spaced. Um, it, it's got to be one of the least complex rock masses. And, and yet its intact strength is still variable. That's just data from UCS tests and it's plotted against depth, but it can plot about anything else, but it just shows you the variability in, in strength for this uh, quite consistent uh, rock mass. So how do we predict its strength? How do we fit a curve to its data? In, in addition to the variability of each test, sometimes we actually don't get the full picture. So he, he's, here's a couple of graphs, uh, three graphs that shows uh, data from the Hawkesbury sandstone and, and two rock types from Brisbane. It's tuff and, and, and the phyllite. Um, we have lots of data. There's hundreds of tests depicted by those little uh, dots there. Um, but most of the, the data is in low confinement. Okay, this is confinement on the, on the x-axis. Um, and most of it hangs around the, the origin. Um, so how do we fit a, that curve? So is it a problem? So I think it's a, it's a problem for curve fitting because we're missing out on, these, on the data that sits at the top here. Okay, so we can't fit that curved envelope um, neatly when, when we've only have uh, a UCS or low con or stress or test work at, at low confinement. Um, practically, though, maybe it isn't a, a, such a big problem. Um, a, a lot of the failures that I've observed, um, and I'd like to say more, all of them, um, because I, I'm struggling to think of cases where it, it wasn't the case, but you can't use, you know, sweeping statements. So we're going to say practically all of them, they occur at under low confinement. So, so maybe, and, and we'll, we'll show that uh, in, in, in coming slides. So, so maybe we only need the, the data at the, at the low confinement area. And we're not too fast with what the curve looks like at the top end. Those couple of slides that we've just gone through, we're looking at the strength, okay? But the variability happens on other properties. And this is a slide that's showing uh, rock mass modulus. Here we have the Hawkesbury sandstone. Um, it, the modulus is on the y-axis in, in these graphs. Um, it's showing on, on these, the, these three here, uh, the x-axis is UCS, but it, it could be as the, the, the top right um, the graph is showing, it's just rock type but it just shows the variability in, in, in modulus as well. So bear in mind that we're going towards the um, estimated rock mass. This is just intact rock. So um, key takeaways. So if, you, if, you, if you're watching this in uh, fast forward, pause now and go through this slowly, okay? Take it off the three speed. Um, so outlier test results, particularly the UTS, uh, the tensile strength, whether it's uh, uniaxial or, or the Brazilian tensile strength, they can affect the criteria parameters that you, you, you're going to uh, curve fit to. Um, the variation in the test data swamps the differences in the criteria. So if you get broad uh, variation in test data, your criteria will, um, uh, you know, uh, it won't be a nice tight fit. If, if, if your data is, is nice and tight, any of the criteria really can, can fit that data. Um, most of the criteria struggle at the low confinement, particularly in the tensile zone. Um, so, you know, choose a curved criteria, not a straight line, so like Hook Brown, and adopt a tensile cutoff. So there is a, a maximum uh, tensile strength that the intact rock can, can take. So now we're moving down that, um, that spectrum from intact. We're going to look at uh, failures that are controlled by one or two uh, joints or discontinuity or defect sets, uh, interchangeable, those three terms. I tend to use defects. Uh, um, uh, some people use fractures, uh, but it's, that's what I'm talking about here. So planar sliding, 
uh, one set of uh, planar slides. Um, and they're just a couple of examples of some spectacular uh, slope failures. I, this lower left uh, image here from a, a slate quarry taken in the, uh, the uh, start of uh, last century. Um, you may be able to make out, these are ladder ways. That's a ladder going all the way up there. I've got gray hair, but I'm not old enough to have taken that photograph, but that's just a sensational photograph. So that's, that's why it's there, just because I like it. Uh, wedge failure, so we've got uh, two uh, joint sets um, producing a, a wedge failure. Um, and we've got topple. One set dominates. It helps if you've got uh, a second orthogonal uh, joint set to, to uh, in, instigate that, that toppling uh, motion. Uh, and that's a bit of uh, video there that shows toppling happening. So in those failure mechanisms, it's the defect properties that dominate. They control the behavior of that slope or the rock mass. And of the defect properties, it's strength that uh, controls. Defect stiffness is, is also important, but it tends to be a secondary issue. Uh, similar to intact rock, we grab what samples we can, as this guy is doing in that photograph. Uh, it may be, it's a lot harder to, to grab an appropriate sample to be testing. And we take it to the laboratory and we, and we test it. This is an example of a direct shear box. We, we take a sample, we, we try and get um, uh, smooth planar structures to test, and I'll, I'll explain in a moment why we do that. And, and, and we plot results. Uh, we change the, the normal stress and we, we push it and we get a shear stress. We plot that so we can derive um, our shear strength. Three criteria tend to be used. Uh, more Coulomb, which is just our straight line. It gives you a cohesion and a constant friction angle. Uh, sometimes it's called the pattern uh, uh, envelope, and that's that bilinear approach. So it starts off with zero cohesion, a steep friction angle. I'll explain uh, what the parameter I is in a, in a moment, and then it reaches its uh, friction angle. And then Barton and Bandis, which is a, a curved envelope. Um, as the normal stress increases, it crushes uh, any asperities of the roughness and reverts to a constant uh, friction angle. Uh, so uh, these lines here only, I've only put them separate, I've separated them just not, not to imply Barton Bandis is always a stronger uh, criterion, but just to separate the lines so you can see them. Uh, rougher joints tend, this is data from uh, Bandis's um, 1993 paper, joints in moderate strengths, planar joints tend to be linear strengths. Uh, as the rock in strength increases and we get rougher joints, we have a curved linear, or sorry, the, the curved envelope uh, develops. So we need to assess uh, when what type of normal uh, stress our defects will be subjected to. So we identify which of these three criteria will be more applicable. So, you know, more cool is very straightforward, nice and simple. Uh, one uh, friction angle, basically. So you just need to assess in your failure mechanism what, what's an appropriate uh, criteria to use. The Barton and Bandis, as well as the, the, the patent criteria introduce a, uh, they recognize that the roughness of, of a defect in, increases its friction angle and they bring in terms into that, uh, their relationships to, in order to do that. So we measure a friction angle in the laboratory on a, on a small sample that we've selected, and then we adjust it for the field, you know, depending on its, on its roughness. Now, these two uh, tables are very useful guidelines to assist us in considering the defect roughness. The, the pattern approach um, increase, adds to the friction angle, uh, a term here, depending on our observations of the defects within you know, the, the small scale range, 50 to 300 millimeters. So if we can find that they're slick inside or polished, we don't add anything to the friction angle. If they're smooth, we add two degrees all the way up to very rough, we can add 14 degrees. Um, 
Spartan and Bandus do a similar thing, but they have a, a, a larger uh, gradation. Okay, they, they've got uh, the joint roughness coefficient ranging between zero and, and 20 for, for 10 different profiles. Okay, but both of them consider the, 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 the roughness on, on that, that medium, small, small, medium scale. Um, there's variability, that, that's going to be a common theme, okay? Variability in the stuff that we get from a laboratory. We're testing natural, uh, natural materials, both in, 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 in stiffness, that secondary item, or any, and in strength. Uh, there's, a, there's a view, that this is probably one of those other uh, areas that you pause, okay, and, and go slow. So there's a view that there's a, a basic or a, a residual friction angle that's dependent on rock type. Basically, the mineralogy of the rock type. If you know what rock type, this is the basic friction angle for that, for that rock type. There's another view, and it's... Um, so, you know, in, in, in that view, you could get a piece of granite, saw cut it, test it, and that's your friction angle for granite. There's a view... And there's a bit of merit behind this saying, well, if I take that saw cut, I could polish it. I could, you know, grind it down and that would give me another, that will give me a lower friction angle. And then I can polish it a bit more and that will give me a, a lower value again. So there's a concept that, you know, this basic um, friction angle may, isn't a rock type specific uh, value. It depends on, on, the, on the defect that, that you have. So the pragmatic approach is to sample what you can and, and sampling a, a defect, a natural defect in the core is hard enough. Uh, on, on a rock exposure, it's, it's very uh, problematic. But you grab that sample and you test it as is, and then you account for um, the scale of the problem, the, the scale of the defect that's in question by adding, if necessary, um, uh, to that, that friction angle that you've recorded in laboratory. So we've looked at the small scale uh, contribution in a couple of slides earlier. We had that, um, that table and, and that uh, Bandus, Martin and Bandus chart. We also have the intermediate uh, scale and, and this image on the right hand side is from the Australian standards, um, whether the planar through to uh, irregular shaped profiles. But then there's also the larger scale wave. So when we're talking re about rock slopes, we have a bench that's 10 metres, 20 metres, 30 metres tall. We also have a rock slope that might be 200, 300 metres high. So depending on the scale of the, that defect, we might have larger waviness to uh, consider the, the, the strength for, for that particular defect. So we, in our design, we often take a, a, a conservative view that the defects are continuous. And we may be talking about uh, defects when we design for a bench, we're going to say, look, all the joints here are continuous for that bench. On, on larger uh, rock slopes, we might say that the faults that we've encountered, the joints aren't continuous, but the, the faults are continuous. Uh, in, in practice, the continuity is probably not as, as, um, as, as we've taken in, in, in those design elements. And so we might need to consider um, the, the strength of, of rock mass. So we've got part of the failures going through the defect and part is going through a rock mass. And that last little uh, line there is uh, work that was done, uh, found out by um, Mark Diedrichs. It basically said, look, 1% of the failure area is equivalent to a heavily supported uh, system, whether that be uh, rock bolts in an underground excavation, um, or cables in, a, in an open cut line. So you actually only need a little bit of uh, intact uh, area to greatly increase uh, the, the strength of that, that mechanism. We, we, we've got that sedimentary and metamorphic rocks. Uh, some metamorphic rocks may, may show a difference in strength depending upon the orientation. And so you can see the rock, the, the, the core, examples there where um, we could show that uh, the strength in, in one direction, in this direction here, normal to, to the core axis, you tend to think that would be stronger than something that's inclined. And if you put those samples in a laboratory testing rig and, and squash the rocks, crush the rocks, you'd end up something like this, where you'd end up with a peak 
uh, strength, could be approaching the intact rock strength uh, when, when the bedding is normal to the load, reducing to a, to a minimum, which could be just the friction angle of, of the defects at, at some point, then, then increasing again as the uh, sample is turned. Now you can build this in um, to your failure criterion. And there's an example there um, from the, uh, the rock science programs that allows you to do that. Um, but often you can deal with that if you understand the failure mechanism. So if we knew that failure was going to occur on, on a bedding plane, for instance, we, you know, you could just put in the strength of that bedding plane. Uh, or you can do it with this, this approach. All right, so now we're going into the mechanisms that go into the, in, into the, into the rock mass and involve the rock mass. Let me get rid of that dot there. So we have uh, so lots of criteria for uh, rock mass strengths. Uh, not as many as for the intact, but they're, they're still uh, quite, a, quite a few. Uh, ones out of interest, okay, some of them you, you, you know about, ones that you may not have seen before. Uh, cohesion weakening, friction strengthening, that's essentially more cool, but it recognises that you, you break cohesion first and then you mobilise friction angle. So the cohesion comes first uh, and then the friction angle takes over. The one that I'm going to be talking about a bit more because of its, uh, I suppose, its embeddedness in, into our in, into rock mechanics is, is hook brown. Okay, so hook brown, and I'll explain this, take from intact and takes it into, into rock mass strength. Uh, a development of the hook brown, um, this unfortunately named damage initiation spall in limited criteria, it's just too long, isn't it? Um, but it, it, it's, it was designed, uh, it came about specifically for uh, massive, or failures in, in massive brittle rocks. Um, and that's hook brown, but realizing that crack initiation happens a lot earlier, a lot, at a lot lower strengths, uh, stresses, say a third to a, a fifth of, of the UCS. Then it builds up, it starts spalling, and then it eventually uh, uh, joins back up, if you like, the uh, hook brown criterion. Um, and we'll also talk a, a little bit about the synthetic rock mass, which is a computer simulation of, of uh, rock strength. Okay, I think it's interesting. Sorry, I'm just going to grab a bit of water. I think it's interesting. In fact, I think it's important to understand the background of all, our, all the stuff that we use. Let's understand where, where the backgrounds come from. So this is Hook Brown 1980. When they were developing their rock mass strength, this is the, the database that they used from uh, Panguna, Andesite. Um, data that was collected by uh, Jager and in the 60s, published in 1970. So um, quite a modest uh, database. We, we essentially have five intact uh, samples of just uh, drill core. We have seven uh, points of six inch diameter core. And then there's a whole bunch of recompacted stuff. So, they, you know, gone into the, into the dump, collected bits of rock, shoved it into uh, a mold, recompacted it and, and tested it. So part of the, the, the Hook Brown 1980 paper, they, they revised the link. Uh, there was a, um, between rock mass rating, RMR, that, uh, that the um, uh, Bianowski and, and the South African uh, uh, mines um, uh, developed in 1973, they, they linked his, his, uh, the, the rock mass rating and they gave rough ideas of what the, uh, at that stage it was more cool on parameters, how the strength of that rock mass. Hook Brown continued that, they revised that little, um, that connection between a class of rock and the strength and they plot, plotted it here on, on this uh, chart down. The, so there, there's the, the RMR rating, the, the classification. Uh, this is their hook brown uh, parameters, M and S, they're the hook brown parameters. And here, here are the dots. So five dot data points of intact core landed up here, that one dot there, that's five, five test results landed in one, one, one point on this graph. 
uh, seven dots here of the undisturbed uh, six inch samples landed here for the parameter M and here for the parameter S. And that's basically it. These other dots here, they're the recompacted stuff. So based on that limited, I don't think people get offended if I use that term, limited data set, we've got our relationship, that link. At this point, they were linking RMR to hook ground, but subsequently becomes our link between the uh, geological strength index and hook ground parameters. So we need to remember that. And, and, and just to, to further understand the context of that 1980s uh, rock mass database, here's a couple of uh, photographs that my colleagues, uh, Adrian Smith and, and Michael Hapti, they collected a large sample, 450 millimeter diameter sample of siltstone. And you can see there's the size of it compared to a couple of guys. Um, you can see relative to this lump of siltstone and even that big size compared to here, you can think, well, it doesn't represent a whole rock mass. It just represents a small section, but it's still, it's an unwieldy, unwieldy lump of uh, rock to, to move and to test. This, this is a cross section of the 450 millimeter diameter core and the six inch core tested by in, 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 the, in the 60s, and, you know, and then including Hook Brown's 1980 paper. And roughly that's what it looks like. Okay, so you can see the seven samples that were used in, in linking this Hook Brown um, connection between rock mass rating and their uh, criterion, it's a bit skinny, okay? It's, it's, it's a bit limited in, in, in data. Um, I, I, I may have come across as dissing this um, uh, criterion, and that's probably where I was a couple of years ago. Uh, it's important to note that this, um, the original criteria here that had a, uh, um, a square root term was actually, um, there was a theoretical basis to it. There's a, there's a Griffith uh, crack theory that's embedded in this. So it's not just because of these couple of tests and they, they, they drew a line, okay? So let, let's, I, I don't want to, you know, throw the, the baby out with the bathwater type of thing. Uh, a few years ago, it was generalized to that. So it's not just a, a square root. But, so, so when I looked at this, I was thinking, well, okay, that was 1980s, that was 40 years ago. We've done something since then, haven't we? Well, we've all just fallen asleep and our, uh, our uh, uh, practices, you know, must have done something in that time. So I started looking at, and sure enough, there's there's quite a few documented cases, and and these are the ones that um, uh, came when I was looking at this uh, a few years ago. They, they were the existing, and then I added a bit from tunnels in in my experience in tunnels in Hawkesbury Sandstone, and then I looked at uh, coal mining. Uh, my my previous life, I was a, I was a coal miner. Um, so there's 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 a, there's a, there's a few uh, quite a lot actually in, in in coal mining which we'll get into. So from these hard rock um, cases, either the uh, the the principal stress of the major and minor principal stresses were either given in the in the publication, or you could calculate them. I calculated them based on the on the geometries uh, included in in those uh, papers in those publications. And just plotted them, you know, just plotted them on a stress plot, similar to what you would do in a laboratory with a laboratory test, and then fit a curve to it. So um, the massive sulfides, they, they these these are in a series of, of three graphs, sets of three graphs. It's basically failed, marginal, and stable. And so the, the lines actually separate quite well, separate the data quite well. Uh, similarly for the case in limestone, the iron ore. Uh, some of the uh, uh, smaller uh, case studies as well. In, for the tunnels in Hawkesbury Sandstone, slightly different, uh, more, uh, in, more, more work needed to be done. Had to model the, um, the conditions, had to simulate the conditions and estimate the induced stresses at the time of failures that occurred. This was a failure that Les, uh, Les McQueen uh, published uh, oh, two decades ago. Um, say, say it uh, quickly, it doesn't hurt. Uh, and, and then uh, plot, again, plot the uh, induced stresses um, in, a, in a stress plot and fit a curve, fit a, fit a line. Again, solids, uh, failures, open 
uh, circles are where failures didn't occur. And, and the curves, there's, there's some uh, 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 data that needs to be explained, but generally it's, it's, it's quite good fits. So as, as I alluded, the, the bulk of the, the data has come from coal mining. So there's a lot of information, okay? It's, um, it's a database that contains 162 failed or collapsed pillars uh, and 507 uncollapsed pillars. And then there's more than 507 uncollapsed pillars around the world, but this is 507 uncollapsed pillars in the same uh, colliery as the collapsed ones. We know the geometries of the pillars. We, we know the, uh, the depths. Um, so there's information that we can use. One of the questions though that uh, we needed to address is, can coal be considered to be a brittle rock? Because these failure criteria, the hook brown failure criteria is for a brittle rock. So there's uh, work done by um, uh, Tony Methurst and, 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 and Ted Brown uh, that show that coal can be considered to be uh, a brittle rock under certain circumstances. Basically when it's not um, uh, under, under low confinement, it, it can be a, a brittle rock. So with that knowledge, Back in, into the into the modeling, so we modeled uh, the geometries of, of the pillars, uh, the depths of the pillars, estimated the induced stresses, plotted again those pillars that failed against those pillars that didn't fail, and curve fitted lines to see if we could separate it. And um, there's again there's good um, ability to differentiate between the two cases those collapsed and those uncollapsed cases. So now we have a rock mass database that's not just the seven samples of six inch core. There's, we've nearly got a thousand cases, all right? So it's a much larger database that we can then go and explore and, and how to, 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 to link a, uh, uh, or how to convert into uh, rock mass strengths. The, the next step is we need to link, you know, how do we do that with a classification system? And so, and so there's many classification systems. Common theme, right? We have many criteria for impact, many, many uh, uh, criteria for rock mass strength and, and many criteria for rock mass classifications. The two most commonly used are the ones that have highlighted in uh, dark blue, the Q and uh, the geological strength index. Um, by the latter's antecedents, RMR is also uh, discussed. Um, and of course, RQD um, uh, features in, 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 in all of these uh, uh, classification systems. I won't be going any further with the Q system just because there's, there's no direct link between it and rock mass strength. Okay, to, you can use Q, but you've got to go through something else, RMR, GSI, something to get into a, a rock mass string. Um, that little uh, pink blob is uh, an area where the Q is probably uh, best uh, used in, in the middle ground. So we'll talk about uh, our classification system, the, uh, the GSI, the Geological Strength Index. Now, Personal view, it's been in a tortuous development. Having it started off with uh, Everett Hook saying, look, the RMR is just too much of a numbers uh, game. Um, we need to get more geology in, 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 into, the, into a classification system. So he came up with this seemingly cute way to do it. Um, little sketches on the side. This is what the rock mass looks like. Okay. Quite a detailed description of the rock mass on, on the, uh, the y-axis, uh, horizontal axis condition of the defects, okay? Because our rock masses, they're, they're controlled by uh, the blockiness, the defect condition. Um, other people didn't like that because it was subjective. Geologist A would come in and, and call it a GSI of 60, geologist B would come in and say, no, it's 50 uh, because of this and this and this. Um, so we wanted to get back to more of a, a numeric solution. Um, I'm sure it also was also driven by spreadsheets. We got a lot of data. We can do a lot of stuff in spreadsheets. That's a lot faster just to automate rather than to looking at uh, individual core photographs. 
uh, and rock slopes. Um, so it's still a numbers game. Um, but there's been some research, and I was part of, of, of one little bit of work that I did as well to compare, okay, if we did the numbers game, uh, or if we actually did get the geologists to, to, to look at the same rock, where would we end up? Um, and it tends to be that we're, that we're then plus or minus 10. So for a geological uh, classification, it's, that's pretty good, I think. So whether you go the, the numbers or the geology uh, route, uh, you end up probably around the same part of, of uh, the classification. Most of the time, there's some cases where if you went the numbers game, you'd end up with a zero when you should actually have a slightly higher GSI, or in this case, here, quite a, a bit higher. Um, because the numbers game is driven by RQD and RQD is not, uh, it's not uh, infallible. There's lots of issues with RQD as, as we know, um, but it's, it's what we have to use. Um, there's also a tendency, though the GSI looks like it's a, it's a matrix, okay, we can have this range, it tends to be linear, okay? Rock masses that I've seen, published, I've worked with, the quality of the rock mass, if you have a, um, a variable quality of the rock mass or uh, uh, change in, in rock mass qualities or variation, they tend to be linear. They tend to fly down this diagonal. And there's uh, also a restriction. This blue patch in the middle, it tends to be, you know, between the, the values of 30 and 65, that's where GSI tends to work the best. So that, that's why in this little bit of an introduction to this slide, I said it's had a tortuous development because it started off saying, look, I don't want numbers and RMR is a bit too restrictive. It doesn't really test the, uh, the, the, the full range of, of rock type. And we ended up with, I've got back to numbers and it doesn't really test the, the full range of uh, rock types. But maybe the full range of rock types is actually along this diagonal. And we don't have the case where we have very good, good surface conditions, but it's laminated sheared rock mass. That doesn't happen. And so that's kind of alluded to in some of the subsequent uh, GSI charts. Similarly, we don't have intact massive rock with very poor uh, defect conditions. And that's why that's in the NA up at the top here too. So how does this GSI classification now link to the larger, um, rock mass database that we have and how does the those hook brown parameters how do they look like now so this is the uh, hook brown parameter m or the ratio m b m i the b meaning the rock mass the m i being the intact and that, that that ratio how does that look like against uh, gsi so i've got all the points from the extended database up here these are the points from the 1980s. Okay, the circles, the open circles, are the recompacted samples. So, you know, question: how, how, What does that represent in, in in a rock mass? The the plus symbol is the six inch core. Okay, now we've got all the data that sits up there. So I'm suggesting that perhaps this 1980s version of an equation needs to be, you know, lifted up a little bit. And that's, I've come up with that. I've put this line uh, 30, okay? Anything less than 30 needs to be used cautiously. Now that is a direct quote from uh, Ted Brown's uh, not, uh, 2008 uh, paper. So uh, don't just assume that it's, it's got to get, it's give me a GSI of 20 and therefore I'm, I'm good to go. You, you need to think, think about it. Same idea. Uh, this is for the hook brown parameter S uh, and how it varies against GSI. That's the one point from the 1980s uh, data. And this is the collection of, you know, the 900 and something nearly a thousand uh, cases that exist now. The big changes in that parameter A. Uh, so initially in 1980s, it was always 0.5 square root. 
it was then adjusted to slowly increase to a maximum of 0.65. There's data that suggests it should be a little bit higher as well. So we've got now a lot more data than we had in the 1980s. We, we should use it. You know, we, we, we should use that data to estimate the, the hook brown parameters. So these, these are equations that we, we should be using. Uh, there's slight changes between M and S, big changes in, in A and how that uh, uh, changes with GSI. I've also looked at uh, rock mass modulus, and this is, a, this is the, the data of undisturbed rock masses. There's, if you through, go through the literature, it's, it's really hard to find uh, data on rock mass modulus measured in situ for um, uh, rock mass. Anyway, so this is this, that, that data and it plots the, the dark pink line. I'm not sure why I chose pink. Hopefully you can see it on the screen. The dark pink line is that equation that's uh, offered by uh, Hook and, and Dietrichs in 2006. It kind of fits the data quite nicely. Uh, the only uh, caveat, if there is one, is to note that there is variability. And so perhaps we should test uh, the bounds a little bit. And so added these two uh, bounding uh, curves. So as I said, I'd, I'd introduce uh, the synthetic rock mass. So this is a technique or a numerical uh, technique, computer uh, models that will model individual blocks separated by defects. So we start with a, uh, a discrete fracture network that we can then import into, into a numerical model. So synthetic rock mass, it simulates, it's, 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 it's intended to simulate the behavior of the rock mass numerically. So we take a, 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 a well, sorry, it, the synthetic rock mass traditionally started, if that's a, can I use the word traditionally, but the synthetic rock mass, anyway. It started off with a bonded particle uh, approach where each, each um, particle uh, was connected, um, contacts just with each other, and microfractures could develop between them. Uh, the microfractures could collase um, and, you know, failure could develop. So it wasn't um, a predefined uh, failure mechanism. You know, they could um emerge the failure mechanism could could, could emerge um, so there's so the, the 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 thinking was i'll if i could simulate the uh, laboratory test with this bonded particle i can calibrate that rock mass and then once i've done that i can upscale it to my my actual problem um, it's so it's it's got a nice id behind it at its disadvantage is that you need a lot of uh, parameters to calibrate against. Uh, and you also need large uh, computational uh, powers in, in order to address the large scale problems. There's uh, an alternative that's, that's been developed in the last or uh, continued to develop an alternative. And that's recognizing that uh, most of the failures are governed by defect kinematic. So you don't really need to get into the individual, you know, bonded particle. You don't have to get into the small scale. You can actually have a larger scale and, and, and assume that's almost an intact uh, rock. And that's almost intact rock is separated by our uh, defects. So that, you know, for, for the want of better term, my colleague uh, Ji Wu An suggests that this could be called a light, synthetic rock mass light. So there's less models for a start, that less model parameters that need to be calibrated. And so you would you'd grab that type of um, uh, uh, numerical model and you would try and simulate a, a lab test, in this case, a triaxial test. And once having uh, got that triaxial test uh, matched in a laboratory, you can then say, right, here are my parameters for my, uh, my intact rock and here are the parameters for my defects. Right, and depending on the confinement you use in, in, in your uh, simulation, you can have failures that simulate in under low confinement where you just get you know, failure along a, an existing defect. 
uh, or uh, crushed. There was no, no existing defect there. Um, and then higher confinement, there's a lot more crushing uh, occurring. So that, that's got um, um, some merit in, in pursuing, which I'll, I'll explain in a minute. Um, I, I thought it was important, not just to wrap it on with, with some theory, but to show some examples. So I picked um, a case of dolerite. Now, maybe there's some people on, online that may be familiar with this job. Uh, there's, there's a license to, to be had, but um, it's, it's got a convenience in, in that there's both open cut um, and un underground excavations uh, at various scales. So it's an, an important, uh, uh, it's a great example uh, to use. So we'll start off with the best uh, quality rock mass. Okay, with very high strength uh, dolerite. Uh, there's a UCS of 190, a Brazilian of, of 11 MPA. It's fresh, it's 100% RQD. Uh, it's got tight, rough uh, step joints. GSI, I think, was um, has been conservatively estimated to be 80. It's, it's probably 90, at least. Um, so we could use the GSI book brown approach. You know, we could we could estimate that we can stick it in um, to calculate what the rock mass uh, strength is. But uh, in reality, the st stability of this rock mass is going to be controlled by the defects. So we, we should really be looking at okay, what's the defect strength here? And you know, depending on the normal stress, we might think well, uh, we'll use the Barton and Bandis because we want to to optimize or maximize the. Uh, the strength at, at, at low, con, low confinement. Um, we don't believe on low confinement that you know, a, a joint's got any cohesion, so we'll, we'll ignore the more cool one. Or you might think that um, in, in particular problem, uh, the, uh, the, the, the slope uh, is so high that the failure's uh, path is, is gonna be subjected to a high uh, normal stress, and so more cool might be uh, appropriate. So you, you need to think about, again, the, the mechanism that we have. Um, it could also be the type of problem that is amenable to synthetic rock mass. We have a lot of intact rock or nearly intact rock and a, and a little bit of defects. So computationally, it shouldn't be uh, too strenuous uh, a task. Then we step down to a slightly more jointed dolerite, still high, but very high strength, uh, but the RQD is a, a bit lower. There's a bit more joints in there, so it drops to the GSI as well. Um, again, this is this rock mass probably is uh, amenable. It's probably more amenable to the GSI hook brown uh, approach to estimate rock mass strength. Um, depending on the problem, though, if we're looking at a very uh, small uh, scale, maybe it's still uh, defect controlled. Uh, if we're looking for an individual batter, say for a, an open open pit, it might be controlled just by the defects more than than the rock mass. Um, and again, depending on the uh, size of the problem, synthetic rock mass might be okay for the individual uh, batter. It may not be for you know, 200 meter high slope. We start to get maybe too many defects in there to be computationally uh, efficient. Moving to a more jointed and yet more, more weathered uh, dolerite, strength has dropped a bit because it, it is weathered, RQD is a little bit lower. And, and we think that actually this is the type of rock mass that the GSI probably works best in. It's in that mid, mid range, okay? And it might be too blocky a rock mass to model accurately uh, with the synthetic rock mass. There's just too many structures in there for it to be a computationally efficient uh, method at, at the moment. Um, move on, uh, on, on to the poorest uh, rock mass that we have on the, at this particular site. And I note that, you know, with the GSI is less than 20. So, you know, um, uh, Ted Brown's uh, view, can, you view it cautiously with less than 30. Uh, it's also uh, very variable uh, strength. So there's pieces of, of intact rock, which might be still of very high strength. Um, and then there's pieces of rock that aren't. So there's a lot of variability here. So, um, we may not use uh, the, the hook brown here, but when you, when you, if you do that, you find that 
I nearly get a straight line here. So then you might think, well, maybe my more cool on uh, approach isn't so far wrong or so far off. So you might be able to adopt a more cool on uh, strength parameter for, for this particular uh, rock mass. Um, and similar to the uh, previous one, this is even more uh, fractured. It's, it may be too uh, blocky for individual defects to be uh, simulated. So um, there's a, probably a, a few minutes left just to, to recap. Okay, so I think this is another hold, hold, the, uh, hold the phone moment and, and wind back and, 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 and turn off uh, three speed. So it's important to understand the failure mechanism and the scale of the problem. Is it intact rock that you're interested in? Is it the defects or is it really a rock, rock mass? Um, the next bullet point is directed to a, a lot of my colleagues who get really confused when you offer different rock mass strengths or different strengths and they say it's the same rock mass. And you think, yeah, but it's the same as that steel bar, same as that rock bolt. Under different mechanisms, you're going to have different strengths. And it's okay. It's okay to use different strengths for the same rock mass. We don't have that universal uh, criteria. Uh, when we go through the intact uh, rock um, uh, strength, many of the criteria that exist fit, can fit the data. Um, the variability in testing swamps the uh, the comparisons between the criteria. Be mindful that crack initiation occurs at a fraction of the UCS, the value of the UCS. So uh, a third to a fifth of the UCS, that's when cracks start to develop. It's not to say that everything's all over and that's that's a failure. It's just to, to be, be mindful that's where cracks will, will start. Uh, defect shear strength, um, you can choose the, the more Coulomb linear, the bilinear, uh, pattern or the uh, Barton Bandis uh, curved. Again, it depends on, on the expected normal stress range that your failure mechanism will experience. And whichever one you, you, you um, criteria you use, you adjust the lab test results for the in scale, for the infield uh, scale uh, problem, the, the waviness factor. Okay, rock mass, rock mass failure, but it can always be added to. Um, but it's now more extensive than it was when Hook Brown published their criteria. Okay, so let's use that. And essentially, there are two approaches to take the intact to, and make it into rock mass strength. One is our classification, and one is the computer simulation, synthetic rock mass. Classification, it's convenient. I mean, it can convey quality of rock mass to, to, to uh, our, our colleagues. But it, it is fallible. There are issues with it. Um, advantages, it, it does link to precedent. We've got more than 40 years precedent. Um, there are links to, to uh, calculating strengths and GSI uh, is one of them. It's probably the most uh, common. Uh, you just got to note that, that it's the variability. Um, and I use the updated uh, relationships. Um, computers, com the computer uh, uh, simulation, I think we need to calibrate it, not just against our um, lab tests data, but we should calibrate against that large rock mass failure database. Um, and I think it's good if you've got a defined manageable volume of rock mass. Um, and, and maybe um, in, in, in coming years, that, that volume, that manageable volume becomes bigger. I'm going to end with this parable. Um, it, I, 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 I try and, uh, and uh, learn from it. Um, maybe we, we should, I suggest that we should all do it. So it, it's, it's, it's seeking to teach us not to claim absolute truth just by, from what we observe. Listen to others, others have different opinions and you know, we may not be the, uh, the, you know, uh, the rock mass strength gospel according to Robert. You know, it, it's, 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 a, it's a view, okay? so the blind man and the elephant. Um, thank you very much. Now, uh, I understand that this webinar will be on PSM's webpage. Um, if you want to download it and fast forward or pass it on, that, that'd be great. The other two that we've 
uh, PSMs provided, um, uh, Mark Eggers and, and Tim Sullivan's uh, webinars. They're, they're on the web page as well. Um, this uh, presentation was largely uh, uh, my uh, PhD thesis and I managed to, uh, so there's a couple of books, right? You can download on, on the webpage or write in and you can get them hard copy. I, I, I don't, look, I don't know what we're doing. If, if, if you want them, we'll post them to you, maybe for the cost or the post, bridge or something like that. Um, there won't be much. Anyway, uh, thank you for your time. Um, if you've got any questions, mail them in, I suppose. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll reply. Okay, thank you.